So what y'all know about King Solomon? You know anything about King Solomon out of Lexington? King Solomon, do you know who King Solomon was out of Lexington? He, uh, he was a homeless person, and he drank a lot. But during the, I think it was a cholera epidemic, I want to say it's cholera, his uh, alcohol poisoning and his uh, penchant for drinking alcohol actually built up his immune system, so he did not have it and was able to help clear Lexington of many bodies without getting sick himself. Uh, a couple things. A fast food strip search in Kentucky. <laughs> I don't know if you know about this, but you probably heard the variations of the tale. Somebody calls an employee out of uh, McDonald's, asks the manager or tells the manager that somebody in their um, McDonald's place has stolen something. So let me just read this. You may have heard variations of the tale before. Someone calls a fast food restaurant claiming to be a police officer and instructs the manager to strip search a female employee. Eventually, the caller hangs up and everyone realizes they've been, they've been halved. They had. In fact, the story is no myth or an urban legend. It actually happened, and it happened at a McDonald's restaurant in Mount Washington, right here in Kentucky on April 9, 2004. Mount Washington. Mount Washington, Kentucky. Come on. Come on. If there's somebody over there calling you and they're saying the cops to strip search your employees don't do that don't do that that's a bad idea bad bad idea the prankster told the manager that she needed to bring an 18 year old female employee into the office and order her to remove all her clothing except for an apron ostensibly because she was accused of stealing someone's purse so that doesn't even make sense you're stealing a purse so you got to be strip searched if you stole a purse something might be in your crotch that doesn't make any sense uh, you can't fit a purse up in your crotch so the manager called home, asked her fiancé to come to the store and help her out with the matter. An idea that was sanctioned by the police officer on the phone, so the person on the phone is a police officer. Yeah, yeah, you can go ahead and help. And while the manager tended to the store, she handed the phone over to her fiancé, who continued to follow orders given. The caller instructed him to remove the employee's apron, leaving her completely nude, and to have her do some strange exercises. So the caller instructed him to remove the employee's apron, leaving her completely nude, and then making her do exercises and shit. Now, alarm bells should have been going off in everyone's head, right? No. The fast food interrogation went on for hours as the guy happily complied with the bogus cop's increasingly bizarre request. There's no telling how far things would have gone if the manager had not called the main store manager on the other line and found out that the police had not contacted him about this, even though the man on the phone had assured her that he had. It was only at this point they all claimed that the long overdue light bulb went off over their heads. They suddenly remembered that in the real world, real cops don't ask managers to strip search their employees. Mount Washington. Come on, Mount Washington. Mount Washington, Kentucky. Fortunately, someone had the good sense to dial star 69 on the phone and found out that the, the imposter had been calling from a supermarket payphone in Florida because the call was made with a calling card. Police eventually were able to trace it to a correctional facility who was arrested and extradited to Kentucky to stand trial. The jury found him not guilty. And what the victim? After years of litigation, she finally emerged victorious against McDonald's. October 2007, a jury awarded her $6.1 million in punitive cost and damages. Um, the real inventor of the radio was uh, Nathan Stubbleford out of Kentucky, but what something, Stubblefield, and something I had not said before um, that he had died of starvation, a crazed hermit in his shack in the wilderness of Almo, uh, but not before destroying all his prototypes, fearful his inventions would be stolen again by big city slickers. He's buried in Stubblefield Cemetery, also known as Bowman Cemetery, on Route 2075 in Callaway County. A road near his place of death has been renamed Radio Road, but for poor old Nathan Stubblefield, Stubblefield is way too little and way too late. So Charlie Manson is from Kentucky, so that's a bad example, though Manson frequently makes people's top ten list of serial killers, but Charles Manson, as though as far as anybody knows, never killed a single person. Charles Manson never killed anybody, and he even denies that he told his minions to kill anybody. So perhaps Sharon Tate was murdered by his minions not out of his orders, not out of his malice. Perhaps they just did it upon their own... Um, you know, their own cognition. So, currently he resides in California's Corcoran State Prison, inmate number B33920. Donald Harvard, Donald Angel of Death Harvey, 
So you you want to you want to see a psychopath? Forget Charles Manson. This motherfucker is fucking psycho. The psycho serial killer. The psychopath serial killer. Sociopath. Donald Harvey. Donald Harvey is probably one of the worst people that's come out of Kentucky. Your Confederates are bad enough, and the Ku Klux Klan is bad enough. They killed a lot of people. Um, but in terms of individuals, I don't know anybody that's actually killed more. So Kentucky produced a real serial killer, which boasts one of the highest body counts of all time. Donald Harvey spent his formative years in Appalachia and Boonville. He now claims to have killed 87 people, but the official toll is somewhat lower, between 36 and 57. So Donald Harvey says he's killed 87 people. He would probably know who, how many people he's killed more than anyone else. Maybe he's inflating it. Maybe he's bragging. But uh, they say the official's between 36 or 57. But he said 87. He calls himself the angel of death, but his mother told a reporter, My son has always been a good boy. Harvey earned good grades in high school, but dropped out because he found education boring. Drifting along aimlessly, he became a factory worker in Cincinnati for a while, but returned to Kentucky in the town of London in 1970 when his grandfather was ill. Harvey spent a lot of time at Marymount Hospital visiting his grandfather. The nuns took a shine to him, and one of them offered a job as a hospital orderly. He jumped at the opportunity and started work the next day. After just a few months of changing bedpans and inserting catheters, something snapped in him. No one really knows what exactly happened, but Harvey started to kill the patients. Was he alleviating the suffering as he appears? Was he angry with them, or did he just like to watch people die? In any event, one evening, Harvey was checking on a stroke victim when the patient became unruly and angry, lashing out at him. Bad move. The next day, I knew I smothered him, Harvey said. It was like it was the last straw. I just lost it. Amazingly, no one suspected flat foul play. Three weeks later, Harvey disconnected an elderly woman's oxygen tank. Again, no one thought anything of it. Unlike most serial killers who use one favorite technique, Harvey tried many different murder methods. Plastic bags, drugs, you name it. But being exceptionally bright, he wanted to experiment, no doubt. One of his most sadistic murders involved a patient who suspected Harvey was trying to kill him. The patient hit Harvey with a bedpan. Harvey regained his composure bided his time, and shoved the coat hanger in the man's catheter. The patient developed sepsis and died slowly and painfully. Shit. He fucking took a coat hanger and he shoved it in the man's catheter. Okay, a catheter is the tube that goes through your dick so you can pee. And he took a fucking... Okay, a coat hanger, and he, and he, and he caused sepsis, and he wound up dying in agony. So one night under arrest for burglary, Harvey, who was drunk, started blabbing about all the people he killed over the past year. So he's drunk, and he's fucking blabbing about all this. The cops couldn't substantiate his claims, so he wasn't charged with murder. He pleaded guilty to theft, and he hightailed it out of town. That was a close one for him, right? Then he joined the Air Force. However, he had problems in the military and was discharged after less than a year. In 1975, he took a job at the Cincinnati VA Hospital, where with little supervision on the night shift, he was able to dive back into his killing sprees studying medical journals to learn how to disguise the murderers. He killed patients with rat poison in the dessert, some kind of testament to the tastiness of hospital food, that the patients couldn't tell any difference. Put arsenic and cyanide in their juice, suffocated them with plastic bags and wet towels, and injected cyanide into IVs. In the 1980s, he branched out from helpless hospital patients. He slipped arsenic into his lover, Carl Howler's, Howler's food to make him too sick to leave the apartment they shared. Harvey suspected Howler was being unfaithful. He put hepatitis serum in a neighbor's drink and put arsenic in another's pie. When Howler's father had a stroke, Harvey visited him in the hospital and put arsenic in his pudding, and he died that night. Eventually, Harvey landed at Drake Memorial in Cincinnati, where he killed 23 patients over 13 months. Not until 1987 did it all begin to unravel. At the autopsy of patient John Powell, the coroner smelled burnt almonds, a sign of cyanide. Burnt almonds is a sign of cyanide. Powell's friends and family were cleared, so hospital employees were suspected. When investigators found out that Harvey was called the angel of death because he always seemed to be nearby when a patient died, their radar finally went off. A search warrant for Harvey's apartment paid off big time. Police found jars of cyanide and arsenic, occult books, how-to books on poison, and a diary. Why do serial, serial killers keep diaries? When he was first caught, he confessed to his public defender, William Whalen. 
that he committed 33 murders over 17 years, but the number kept growing until it reached 70. Investigators were skeptical that anyone could kill so many people without arousing suspicions, and Harvey's mental state was tested, he found in their assessment, to be mentally sound. Harvey is now serving multiple life sentences for the murders in Ohio and Kentucky. So he's mentally sound. So, like, he, he, he's mentally sound. Serial killers are not crazy. They're mentally sound. They understand their actions and their judgments. They just don't have any morals. They have no ability to empathize with anybody else. They're sadistic, oppressor. They love death, not life. They love hurting others, not helping others. So Harvey's mental state was tested, found in their assessment to be mentally sound. Harvey's now serving multiple life sentences for the murders in Ohio and Kentucky. When a Columbus dispatch reporter asked why he killed, Harvey said, Well, people controlled me for 18 years, and then I controlled my own destiny. I controlled other people's lives, whether they lived or died. And after I didn't cop for the first 15, I thought it was my right. I appointed myself judge, prosecutor, and jury, so I played God. Harvey is eligible for parole in 2047 when he'll be 95. Still not too old to slip a pinch of arsenic into some little drink somewhere. 2047, Harvey, uh, Donald Harvey, Donald, like Donald Duck, Donald Harvey. 2047 is when he'll get out, so 35 years from now. King Solomon, I'm going to end it with this story. King Solomon, one of the most amazing things about human beings is that there's no telling how they'll react in a crisis. In the early 1800s, William King Solomon was well known as Lexington's town drunk. Lexington has a town drunk now, today. They have their own King Solomon walking around their streets today. So we've had precedent for this exact same thing. And here's what happened. So he supported himself and his alcoholism with occasional odd jobs such as digging ditches. But one day the police decided that they've had enough of this man's lowering the class of their fair city. And they busted him for vagrancy. His sentence was to be auctioned off as a servant to the highest bidder. If anyone at the time felt this was an extreme penalty for the crime of standing on a street corner without money, history did not record their sentiments. Ironically, Solomon was sold for 18 cents to a free African-American woman who put him to work hawking her baked goods at roadside stands. So, what are they saying? This is a black man, uh, an older black man who was sold as like a slave to another a free African-American woman who used him for baked goods at roadside stands. Summer of 1833. So, 1833 hits Lexington. And it's the year of a horrible cholera epidemic. Cholera is just sweeping over the land. Half the population of Lexington evacuated the city and leaving the streets literally filled with over 500 corpses. So you got 500 corpses in Lexington because of this cholera epidemic in the 1830s. So 1830s, you got this cholera epidemic um, that's filling like over 500 corpses. There was an every man for him since sense of anarchy and panic was in the air. Summer of 1833, as law enforcement broke down, the city officials refused to go near the bloated bodies for fear of contacting the plague themselves. Solomon, William King Solomon, volunteered to deal with the bodies. Completely without help, he transported the corpses all the way to the cemetery and gave each of them a proper burial. It took over two months and around-the-clock work. He paused only to sleep and presumably for an occasional swig from his hip flask. And even then, he slept on the ground right there in the cemetery and immediately resumed his task upon walking. By autumn, the epidemic had passed. The good citizens of Lexington returned to their homes and life settled back to normal. Solomon was made a free man once more. It is written that on the first day of court session that fall, the judge noticed that Solomon was one of the spectators in the back of the courtroom and came down from the bench to shake his hand. All the other citizens gathered round to shake Solomon's hand as well. King Solomon, William King Solomon, died in 1854. 30, uh, 21 years later, was originally buried in an unmarked grave until years later when someone finally decided maybe he deserved a little better than that. Why didn't Solomon contract cholera himself while handling all those corpses? Because unbeknownst to people in 1833, cholera is not spread person to person, but primarily through contaminated drinking water. And Solomon was a drunk, so he didn't drink the con contaminated drinking water. Right now, you got a man named Henry Earl. Henry Earl in Louisville, who is the King Solomon of Lexington. He's been arrested over a thousand times. Louisville has arrested this poor black drunk man over a thousand times that's what Lula has done have they spent a dime on getting him a house and getting him a place to stay and helping him out in his life and showing him some love and compassion or they just keep on hitting him over the head with all these charges a thousand charges you ain't fixing the fucking problem Lexington you stupid motherfuckers a thousand times a thousand arrests 
A Thousand Arrests by Henry Earl. They also call him James Brown. So Henry James Brown Earl. And he's famous because he's been arrested over a thousand times. And he's he can be the King Solomon. You know, we had a homeless black person who cleaned up the cholera epidemic. It was good that he was there. Why can't we ever do good right first? Why we gotta wait till... Come on, Lexington. Stop with the bullshit. Quit arresting that motherfucker. Get Henry Earl, James Brown to home. 